Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you would. It's good to see you tonight. I'm glad that you're in church with us, both those that are here and those that have tuned in with us on, uh, on EMIC. Tonight, as I said, we're beginning our series on freedom. And what I want you to do to begin with, turn to the book of Luke chapter 13. The book of Luke chapter 13, as you're turning there, let me just introduce this with a couple of statements, a couple of comments about freedom. What does freedom look like to you? In your life right now where you are, what you are experiencing, what is freedom to you? Would freedom be the deliverance of a habit? Would freedom be the, the, the tearing down of a stronghold? Would freedom be a different way of thinking? What would freedom be to you? Would freedom be uh, an addiction that has hung on you for so many years that you wanted to get rid of, that you tried to get rid of, that you worked so hard to get rid of, and to see yourself totally free from that. What is freedom? What does freedom mean to you? Is it the way you relate to others? How they relate to you? Your response, your reaction to others? What does freedom mean to you? What does it say to you? You know, as I was just talking now, I was thinking about my own father. And my father was both a, a, a smoker and a drinker for many years. He came up at a time during the, the 1930s when he was a teenager and into the 40s and his 20s when he was serving in World War II. And back then, everybody smoked. People were smoking. That was a big thing. Even in advertising during the 50s, it was just stylish to smoke. And so there was a lot of pressure on people to do that because of, of what the world considered people to be in status if they smoked, if they had that cigarette. And I can just remember as a small child, my father smoking. And for Christmas, they would give packs of cigarettes for Christmas. My father also drank. And in the, the business that he was in, working in New York, he was under a lot of pressure, and that was his outlet. That's what he was what he thought he could do to take away the pressure and the pain was to drink. I can remember one time as a small child, I, I must have been four or five years old, and I walked around into the kitchen on a Saturday morning and my father reached up high up on the cupboard and pulled down a bottle of gin. I can see it now. Opened up the top, poured a glass of it and drank it right in front of me. And so he struggled with that for many years. But I am so thankful for the Lord in his life. And I'm so thankful that in 1963, my father made a decision to quit drinking. My father and my uncle, Uncle Joe, they were sitting in a bar together. My parents had separated at that point. During that summer, they had separated. He was living in a different place. It was all kind of a wonderment to me because as a child, you don't quite understand these things. You don't see what's going on in your own household. Why is he living there? Why are they not getting along? And my father was sitting in a bar with Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe is a commercial fisherman. This is on the East Coast, up in New England. Just a, a real rough, tough kind of character. Big drinker. They're, so they're sitting there having their drinks. And Uncle Joe looked at my father and said, if you want to keep your family, you're going to have to quit drinking. That's what he did. That's what he did. And my father thought about it, and he made a decision right then and there, I am going to quit drinking. And he had a friend of his at work that was involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. He started going to those classes, and my father, in 1963, laid down alcohol. He laid it down. And never... Never, till the day he died, it, during the week of September 11, 2001, during that week he passed away. He was 85 years old. And from 1963 to 1985, he did not touch a drink. He was free. He was free. And during the course of that time, I was able to lead them to the Lord, and his life just shined bright for the rest of his life. Where cigarettes were concerned, he still smoked. <clears throat> and... Smoked for years and years and years and years. And he went for a checkup one day at the doctor's office, and the doctor showed him a lung that had been affected through cigarette smoking. <clears throat> and it, he went home, he thought about it, 
And on October 21st, 1979, he quit smoking. And he never picked up another cigarette. Why October 21st, 1979? That was the day that Jeremy was born. And he determined that he wanted to see his grandchildren grow up. So he quit smoking. I mean, cold turkey quit smoking. And he was completely free from that. For my father, freedom was not being addicted to alcohol. Freedom was not smoking. And even early on, before he was born again, when he was going to alcohol, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they were still giving God the credit for helping them through on their daily steps and their daily walks with each other. That's freedom. So what is freedom to you? What does freedom mean to you? What does freedom say to you? Freedom to me is living the fullest life possible on earth that is available to us in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what freedom is. Living our lives here in Him, in Christ, walking in Him, walking on the Word, and being clear-headed, seeing clearly, walking in a place of the love of God and achieving everything that He desires for us to achieve with nothing holding us back and nothing keeping us down. And that includes not just, you know, when people think about those kinds of addictions, they think about drugs and drug habits and all of that sort of thing. But, but there are other things that weigh people down and keep them, keep them from running the race that is set before them. Mindsets the way of thinking, how we relate to others, things of the past, things of the past that have held on to us and had a claw dug into us for years and years and years, <clears throat> and, and you find yourself going back to that and reflecting on it, that is something that you need to be free from. Most people <clears throat> don't realize how much they need to be free from the past and to cut the rope and let it go and move on. There are some people right now, adults, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, and on, that are hanging on so tightly to the offense of the past and the way they treated me and the way they did to me and the way they talked to me and the way my parents said things to me. Freedom is being totally and completely released from that and to walk in a place of love that you've never walked in before. Is this kind of freedom doable? Yes, it is. Is it possible? Absolutely. Is it possible to be free? Is it possible, is it possible to be lighthearted in a very dark world? Yes, it is. Is it possible to walk without the weight of the world on your shoulders and to walk totally loosed and freed from that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what this series is all about. There are degrees of freedom that I have experienced in my life. If I could take you back and we could go through various stages of my life and things that I've had to overcome. Every one of us have had to overcome something or some things. Every one of us. None of us are exempt from that. Not a one. We've all had to overcome as we've been singing tonight. We've all had to get over those hurdles in our lives that have just held us down. But if you would approach this in a way that whatever it is that's holding you back and holding you down, your time of deliverance has come. Your time of freedom is here. And it's time to step out today in a, in a purposeful way to take hold of this message and to receive what God has for us in every area of our lives, whether it be fr fear, Fear that has held on, held a grip to us. Insecurities of any kind. Intimidation of any kind. Inferiority of any kind. You are in Christ Jesus. He is in you. And so with that, we have a step into a place of total freedom in our lives that we've never experienced before. And there are some people that walk out their lives and never shake it. They never shake it. There's a message that's coming up in a couple of weeks called Shake Off the Beast. 
shake off the beast. And I'm looking forward to that one. And we're going to shake off the beast. But we'll just take some time and talk about this over the next few weeks and talk about what God has for you and what He wants to do for you. The help of the Holy Spirit. Do not ever forget the help of the Holy Spirit. And don't forget the help of your church. Church is a family. You know, unfortunately, in, in some faith circles, there is a, a notoriety that we have that you, you are less if you are not standing on your faith by yourself, if you're not declaring and confessing the Word by yourself, then something is wrong with you. Now, every one of us in this church are at one level or another of walking by faith. Every one of us are. And there are some people that are going to need some extra help. I appreciate all the help I can get. I appreciate all the support I can get. And it's important for you to know that the pastoral care staff of this church is here for you. And they are headed up by some very capable people. Dr. Tony, Dr. Wilder, Bobby Armstrong, the ministers that are on our staff. These people are, are well qualified to sit down and help you work out things in your life that you need help in. Some of you, you'll receive that as you hear the Word of God and apply the Word of God. Others might need some extra help in some areas. And you have to understand that they are not there for you to come in and just continue to rehearse your problem every week for 25 weeks. We don't do that here. We don't do that here. We, we look for maturity and we look for growth and they help guide you in that. These guys are tough. They're tough, but they love you and they're good for you. So I just mentioned that here right now for those of you that, that do need some help in some of these areas. And on the fifth Wednesday of this series, they will be doing the teaching, or at least I'm not, not, not sure. They will be doing the teaching, yeah, definitely doing the teaching on that last uh, evening on talking about how you maintain that place of freedom. It's one thing for us to talk about it, to get all excited about it, shout about it, run around the room, but it's another thing entirely to walk in a place of, of consistency in that freedom. And I'm a testimony to you tonight that over the years I have walked in degrees of freedom. And as I stand before you this night, I am more free than I ever have been. I am more free than I ever have been. My mind is being renewed. My thinking is being renewed to the Word of God. And I just so appreciate what He does in our lives. Tonight, I want to talk to you about something that is so important to lay a foundation for freedom. And we're talking tonight about God's will is freedom. That's the title of this session. God's will is freedom. You approach everything that you're believing for in your life according to the will of God. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Your faith is energized. Your faith is strengthened when you know it is the will of God for you to experience something from the Word. On the contrary, then, faith stops at the question mark. Whenever there's a question mark, whether or not it's God's will for me to and whatever it is when I was first born again, living, living uh, on the East Coast, I was not as familiar, not near as familiar with the will of God from the Word as I am now. And I'll take healing as a, for instance, there was a time when I thought it was God that put sickness on me to teach me something. And it was being reinforced by others around me who believed this. I didn't hear anything else. And at that time in my early stages, I wasn't skillful enough with the word of righteousness to be able to discover for myself that it was the will of God for me to be healed and for me to be well. So I took time as I learned that and begin to apply it. I can remember when that revelation just, just hit me that I don't have to be sick. It's not the will of God for me to be sick. So you approach everything, whether it's that or prosperity. There are some people that are dead set against prospering. People in the religious world are against prosperity and they have all kinds of reasons why they're against it. But we've been taught and we've been trained and we've given perspective from the Word of God about it and I have no problem with it whatsoever. None whatsoever. Because we've been taught well. 
about how we use that wealth. We know it is the will of God for us to prosper. We know it is the will of God for us to, to be well, to walk in that place of wellness, to have a, a healthy outlook on our lives. We then need to know and be reassured from the Word of God that it is God's will for you to be free. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whatever upsets you, whatever makes you mad, whatever angers you, whatever pushes your button, whatever puts you into a depression, whatever saddens you, whatever tries to bring grief into your life. You see, we're not talking about drugs here. We're talking about human emotions and the things that we deal with and the family issues that, that every one of us have, the experiences that we go through and how difficult those things can be, whether it's a, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, a, a relative of some kind that, that you are right now having such a struggle with because they can just push your button, get your goat, get you upset just like that. Your day may be going along fine, and all of a sudden the phone may ring, and you look at the number, and it's them. And you know those feelings that are in, on the inside. You know what that's like. You can be totally free. Amen. We can be totally free. Amen. Completely and totally free from that. Where persecution is concerned, we can be free from the effects of persecution. They can say it all they want to. They can declare it all they want to. And you know, it's funny, but, but we, we seem to get really upset when that persecution comes, but the Word plainly tells us it's there to steal the Word. The world hates us. They hate us. So how are you dealing with rejection lately? <laughs> they just hate us. But we can walk in a place of being totally free. Absolutely free. And we can walk in a place of total joy in that as well. That's, that's the will of God. That's the desire of God. You know, as I've been meditating on this, thinking about it, I've been thinking about various times where people experienced freedom and what they did. What they did. I was reading today about the liberation of Paris in 1945. What were those people doing? Dancing in the streets. There was exultation. There was great relief in the city of Paris when the Allied forces came, came marching through and the iron fist of Hitler was gone from that nation. What celebration. What celebration there was. And what a, what a sense of elation excitement, thrill. I thought about the Berlin Wall. And you remember the Berlin Wall? In 1961, that, ball, that wall was put up encasing a group of people, people that were cut off from their very relatives across the street. The oppression that settled over that city. And it was Ronald Reagan that made a speech. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He had not intended on saying that, and as a matter of fact, he was advised against it. He was advised against it. So you can imagine the surprise on all of his, his <laughs> cabinet members and those advisors of hers and his, and even his wife. He prophesied and declared it. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down those walls. And do you remember, those of you that do remember watching that, what thrill, what excitement, what joy there was. People walking back and forth through Checkpoint Charlie. Free. Free. Just walking back and forth. Turning around. Walking back and... They're not, they're not stopped anymore. There are no more guards with guns anymore. I mean, there was just great freedom in the city. They're taking sledgehammers and breaking those walls down. Chipping those walls. And that's exactly happen. what happens when you, by faith, step out and begin to tear down the walls in your life that have had you imprisoned. There, there is great joy and there is elation over it. There is a thrill from God when you're free. When you're free. When you're truly, truly free. Truly free. It's the will of God for you to be truly free. Just like this woman that was bound for 18 years. Let's read about her. Luke 13, verse 11. 
There was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent together and could in no wise lift up herself. There are some people, am I in the right chapter? There's a lot of turning pages. Luke 13, verse 11. There are some people that struggle. This woman has struggled with this infirmity for 13 years. There are other people, for 18 years, there are other people that struggle for other things for a lifetime. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. It's not the will of God for you to do it. You can make that decision right now that you don't have to do it. And she was in a position where she was completely bent all the way over. To me, that reflects an inability to see what's right in front of her. And when you're bound up by that stuff on the inside, you can't see what's right in front of you. <clears throat> it's very difficult to follow the path that God has for you when you're bent over like that. That is not the will of God. Don't tell me that that woman for 18 years being bent over, that's the will of God. That's not the will of God. <clears throat> it wasn't the will of God. She couldn't lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and he said to her, Woman, thou art loosed from your infirmity. You are loosed from your infirmity. I like what the NIV translation says. You are set free. You are set free. And that, that word loosed in the Greek it means fully and completely free. Fully and completely free. That's why where fear is concerned, not even a little fear is good. Because why? He delivers us from all our fear. All our fear. Imagine living a life fear-free, completely and totally fear-free. No fear whatsoever. <clears throat> no sense of fear on the inside whatsoever. No fear over your children. No fear over your life. That's the way God wants us to live. That's the, that's the high place that He wants us to go into. And that's exactly what He did for this woman. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And He laid His hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said to the people, there are six days in which men ought to work in them. <clears throat> Therefore, come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him, him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? <clears throat> and ought... <clears throat> And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on this Sabbath day? <clears throat> and it says, when he had said these things, all his adversaries, adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. There was rejoicing that took place. When this woman <clears throat> was delivered, you and I are in covenant with Almighty God through the blood of Jesus. And in that covenant, whatever is His is ours. It belongs to us. It belongs to us, <clears throat> including deliverance of every infirmity, everything that would hold us back and everything that would hold us down. <clears throat> it says here, and ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? Now the phrase there, daughter of Abraham, is a covenant phrase. He was also used with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was called a son of Abraham. <clears throat> daughter of Abraham, son of Abraham, that is a covenant phrase. And was, what Jesus was basically saying here is, this woman is in covenant with God. She needs to be set free. She needs to be loosed. <clears throat> Should not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, Satan has bound, Satan has bound, <clears throat> the root of all bondage is in Satan. 
Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And you and I have authority where he is concerned. We have dominion and authority over that through the word of God, through the blood of the Lamb. So ought not this woman, being a covenant woman whom Satan has bound these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on this Sabbath day? <clears throat> Faith for freedom begins where the will of God is known. And the will of God for us is to be free. It's to be free from everything that holds us down, everything that holds us back. Let's look at a few more scriptures here about this freedom that is the will of God. Look at Psalm 146 with me. To be in, in a place of bondage is to be in a prison, so to speak. It's to be locked up. And that's what it feels like at times. Being locked up somewhere. You feel like you can't move. You feel like you can't you, you can't function under such pressure. Sometimes there is such pressure that comes against us that you feel like you, you can't turn. Sometimes it's so heavy, it's so weighty. Sometimes I would experience that years ago when I was the executive director of the ministry. There would be so many problems to deal with. And I'd sit over there at my desk early on when I started that job, and I'd try to organize it in my mind, and I didn't know where to turn first. We got this, this fire over here and this fire over here and that fire over there. And I would just, it, it would just shut me down. Incapacitate. Incapacitate me. And in those early days, <clears throat> at least I learned enough, I would, I would I'd try to figure it out in my office and then I finally figured out, I just need to leave. I just need to leave and I'd get into my car and I'd drive down to the boat dock. There's a boat dock down here by the lake. And I pull right up to the water, put it in park, roll down the window, and just, just lay there. And let, I'd have to let the Holy Spirit just minister to me, just to get me back where I could come back up here and do my job. One day I went down there, rolled the window down, and I laid my head on, on the, the, the door and looked out and I could see myself in the rearview mirror. And I said to myself, I said, you look really bad. <laughs> I did. I was like drawn. <laughs> and sometimes I'd just go down there and I'd sit, I'd open my Bible and I'd just begin to read. And as I would go along, I could feel the lightness come. Yeah. I could sense it getting better. And when I was ready to go back, when I was ready to drive back up there, then I was ready to be able to face whatever it is that I had to face. There were, there were days, in those early days, I would drive Aubrey to, to daycare out here. She was just real small in a car seat. And sometimes I'd be so glad when she'd fall asleep because I'd go down to the boat, walk and, boat dock and not even come up to work. I and mean, I'd use the excuse, I'd say, well, she's asleep. I can't wake her up. I've got to let, let her keep sleeping. <laughs> and those were, those were some days of pressure. Those were some days of pressure. But when you walk in a place of freedom with Him, you're loose from that prison and no matter what's going on around you, there is a way that the Holy Spirit will direct you and show you how to handle those things. You can, have, you can have the same conditions going on. You can have those same conditions like I had, for instance, as executive director, things that I was facing, $6 million deficit, the pressure, the pressure on, on me at that time. And, and you can have that situation, and you can have the same thing in two different people. And you can have one person over here who is just who is just in bondage to that and locked up and can't seem to roll that care, can't seem to get rid of it, doesn't know how to do it, and have the same person over here who in, has developed themselves, they're walking in that freedom, and every care has been rolled over unto the Lord. Same condition, same situation, but different results. Different results. You wonder sometimes, how can they handle the stress of that job? Well, that's just it. They are, they are not dealing with that stress anymore. They're just dealing with the situation and they have been developed to such a degree that that stress doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother them. They're not affected by it. That's all part of the renewing of the mind. That's all part of the development of understanding what God wants to do for us. 
My mother was a champion worrier. Champion worrier. Even after I got saved, I would go out and I'd go to a Bible study. Go to a Bible study with my friends. And I'd come home and there would be standing at the door, the front door, this shadowy figure. Looked like, looked like it had some sort of a bathrobe on it. And I'd pull up, and then I'd get out of the car, and, and I'd go to the door, and the, the, the bathrobed shadowy figure was gone. Well, I'm home. And my mother all that time had images of me being in an accident, images of the hospital calling. Your son is in the hospital. And it took a lot for my mother to get rid of that stuff and to shake it off to get rid of it in her life. That, that, was, that was a pressure on her. We don't have to live that way. We don't have to live that way. And I read a couple of these scriptures about we're free from that prison, that prison that tries to lock us in. Look at these scriptures in Psalm 146. Psalm 146. And let's look at verse 5. Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help. Oh, praise God for that. Praise God for that. That's a great scripture right there. Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, and keeps truth forever, which executes judgment for the oppressed, which gives food for the hungry. The Lord looses the prisoners. The Lord looses the prisoners. He opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. Think about that woman that we just read about that was loosed. He raises them that are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord loves the righteous and He loves to see the righteous set free. That's His desire. Where it says here, the Lord looses the prisoners, in the NIV translation it says, the Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord sets prisoners free. So if you've been in bondage to some things, if there's some things that have, that have been clouding your mind and your thinking and the way you're acting, I'm telling you, the Lord sets the prisoners free. Say, I'm free. I'm free. Say, I'm free. I'm free. In Jesus' name. Look at another one of these. Turn to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. This is a good one. In Isaiah 42, look at verse 5. Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith the God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which comes out of it, He that gives breath unto the people upon it, the Spirit to them that walks therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, I will hold your hand, I will keep you, I will give you for a covenant of the people, for the light of the nations, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So we see here that the Lord has called the righteous. Not only does God deliver people from the prison, the Lord calls us to do it to loose the captives, set them free. See, that's the whole purpose for this, this message that we're preaching is so that you are positioned to help set others free. You are positioned that when we get all these people coming to our church from all these towns around us and from all over the United States and from the world, that you and I are ready and prepared to reach out to them and to help them. That is what freedom is all about. And it says here that we've been given that power to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and to them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. The NIV translation says to free captives from prison, to release them from the dungeon, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Those who sit in darkness. Those who sit in darkness are not free. They're sitting in that place of the dungeon, that dark, dank dungeon, waiting for that deliverance. 
So the more you and I are free, that's the whole purpose of it. It's not just for us. It's not just for us. But it's for it to go through us, to reach out to other people. Your freedom has everything to do with others. Really, if you look at it, everything we preach has to do with others. Our prosperity, our healing, the renewing of our mind, learning about the reality of righteousness, being the righteousness of God, has everything to do with others. It is the will of God for you to be loosed from the prison house. I want you to look at this one in Psalm. Go back to Psalms and look at verse 68. Say, I'm free. I'm free. Say, I'm delivered. I'm delivered. New, freedom. New freedom. Praise God. Thank you. Psalm 68. The Lord desires for you and I to come to a place of joy, of rejoicing that we've never been in our lives before. You've got to understand this, that there are places that we've never been, things that we've never seen, experiences that we've never had. And in the joy of the Lord, there's a place for you and I to, to be hilarious in our attitude, in our thinking, in our lives. Jesus left us with his joy. And it's his joy that he wants us to function in. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And some of you have been sad. You've been sad. And it's the joy on the inside of us that shines through, that people see and wonder how, how are you so joyful? How are you so joyful? I've been working on that myself, just working over the years on that, on that place of joy. I've gone through a lot of here, years at this ministry, and there were many years in the early days under such pressure, operating under such pressure. I was not a happy person. Not a happy person. And I just made a decision some time ago that I'm going to enjoy my life. Actually, actually, it was after I dealt with all of that situation at ORU, I had come home, and for, for months I had not done a Wednesday night service. The pressure that was up there came home, and I can remember it was one night I was coming to church, and Dr. Tony was preaching that night. We were doing a series, a BI series in the auditorium, and you were teaching that night, so I wasn't responsible for the message, and I was just coming into church, and I had Cody and Aubrey with me, Terry was there with me, and we're driving in, and as we were driving on Boat Club Road, the, the sun was coming down, and let's just remember the sun, how, just how beautiful everything was. I mean, how it just seemed like it was particularly crisp and clear that night. That sun was going down, there, there was just like a, a golden aura everywhere, and they're talking in the car, and all of a sudden, I stopped hearing them talk, and I heard the voice of the Lord. Now, that was back in 2007. That would have been what you, you graduated in, 08. So that was 2008. Yeah, that was 2008. And I heard the voice of the Lord. And I heard it on the inside. Everything else shut down around me. I heard the voice of the Lord. And he said this to me. He said, George, I want you to enjoy the rest of your life. I want you to enjoy the rest of your life. I came in. I, I started a series shortly thereafter about enjoying your life. Sounds like such a simple thing, but there are people that go through their entire lives. They have no joy whatsoever. They don't enjoy their lives. They don't enjoy what they're doing. And I heard that from the Lord, and I made a determination right there. I'm going to enjoy my life. My days of care and worry and pressure and stress are over forever. They're over forever. And when you make a decision like that, and there are some times when I go to bed at night and I can't, I can't sleep on a particular evening, I'll just start to say that. I will just, I'll lay there and I'll say, my days of care and worry and stress and pressure and... <laughs> and I'll do that. I'll go through that. And that's what I've been, I've just been confessing that. I've been declaring that. 
and it really has affected my life through thick and thin and situations that we go through. I just sense a change. There's a change on the inside. What is that freedom? It's freedom. And whatever I have is for you. Is your pastor like pastor like pew? <laughs> it's for you. What I have. And that this, this joy that I have, the world can't take it away. <laughs> it sounds like a song. It is. So that joy is working on the inside. It's a new level of freedom. It's coming up to a new dimension, a new dimension of freedom in my life to not carry that heaviness, to not carry the weight. And I found this scripture in Psalm 60, 68, 68, verse 6. Now let me back up in it a little bit. Oh, let's see, how far do we want to go back up? Ah, oh, just read from verse 1. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Come on, be glad. Let them rejoice before the Lord. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, when you're talking about freedom, show me some praisers and I'll show you some freedom. Show me some people that love to praise, that love to sing before the Lord. And it really does something on the inside of you. Praise does something on the inside. It not only pushes your enemy back, but it, it, it stabilizes and it brings refreshing on the inside just to praise Him and glorify the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm glad in you. Be glad, not sad. Let the righteous be glad in verse 3. Let them rejoice before God. Yay! Let them, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God. Sing praises unto His name. Extol Him that rides upon the heavens by His name, Yah, and rejoice before Him. A father of the fatherless. A judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those which are bound with chains. Now, the NIV translation of that scripture in verse 6 says, He leads forth the prisoners with singing. He leads forth the prisoners with singing. Think about Think about being released from prison and the joy that is there. I know that Brother Copeland himself flew out and was there when Phil Driscoll came out of prison. Oh, what joy was there. What freedom. What freedom there was there. And we think about a, a, a physical prison, but I'll tell you, there are some people that are in prisons, incarcerated right now, that have more joy than some of us do. They are walking in a joy right where they are. They're set free right where they are. And God wants to lead us forth with singing. It is the will of God for you to be free. Amen. It is the will of God for you to be free. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here. He delivers us from bondage. He delivers us from bondage. Over in Exodus, we'll begin to finish it up with this. Over in Exodus chapter 13, some people are living in a place called the house of bondage. That's where they live. That's where they are. And they're struggling with these things. And there are people that struggle with things that they, they may come into church, they may put on a face, but secretly there are things going on in their lives that are tearing them apart. And the Lord wants freedom. He wants deliverance. He wants you to walk in a healthy place with Him. He wants his children. Any parent would want their children to do that. With my children, Jeremy, Aubrey, I want my, I want my kids to be happy. I want them to be joyful. And it always affects a parent when your children are not. Well, that's the same way God is with us. I mean, he's released everything from heaven to us. He's given us all that he has. His son is living inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet still, people struggle. They have a difficult time. But yet, He's there for us. He wants us out of the house of bondage. And it says in chapter 13 of Exodus, in verse 1, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, 
Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of the beast, it is mine. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by the strength of hand the Lord brought you from this place. By the strength of his hand. The Lord delivers us from the house of bondage. What is bondage? Whatever keeps you down. Whatever holds you back. Whatever is that rock that is set on top that keeps the heaviness there. The Lord delivered the children of Israel out of the, out of the house of bondage. And you and I, according to the book of Colossians, have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. <clears throat> and we've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. You and I have been already delivered from the house of bondage. And we've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. We're there now. We're there now. We're there now. And a revelation, revelation, understanding of that itself will help you on your way to walking in that place of total freedom. Delivered from the house of bondage. Look at Romans chapter 8. Two more scriptures here. Romans 8 and then one more. Romans chapter 8. It is the will of God. It is the heart of God. It's who God is. It's what God does for every one of us to walk in that freedom, to be free from whatever straps you down. What, 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 whatever holds you back from dreaming, from being a visionary, from having a vision, whatever it is that's keeping you back from that, God wants us to have that vision. He told Abraham, look up from the place where you are and see. Look up and see. And that's what that woman did that day that was bent over for 18 years. She looked up. She finally stood up, looked around her, had a different view, a different vision. Freedom. 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 In Romans chapter 8, Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And that, those words, Abba, Father, are simply translated, My Father, my dear Father loves me. The house of bondage is over. It's torn down. no longer exists. We're free. We're free. You don't have to carry the past anymore. You don't have to carry the memory of it, the weight of it. Maybe you did do some things. Maybe you did some hard things in the past. It's time to let that go and to be free. To be free. Maybe you're trying to reconcile in some areas and those other people will not reconcile with you. It would do you well to be completely free from that because your freedom will loose them to go into a different direction with you. See, there are things that we have to do, oftentimes, that set the pattern for what goes on around us. We're expecting everybody else to respond when there are some things on the inside that we can do that will help spiritually the situation. It'll change the atmosphere. It'll change what goes on. And you've not been given the spirit of fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, my Father, my dear Father loves me. He loves me. He loves you. And He wants us free. He wants us free. God's will is for you and I to walk in freedom. The very es essence and atmosphere of God is freedom. It is heaven. Heaven is a free atmosphere. Have you, have you ever been to a country before where you felt the oppression of the country? You felt that oppression that was there. Have you ever been in different parts of the United States where you've actually felt an oppression that is there? And you couldn't wait to get out. And once you got out and you got into a different place, you could feel it. There was like, oh. Well, you've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, delivered from the house of bondage. 
This last scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And musicians, if you would please make your way up here. 2 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> We've been talking all night about the will of God. For you to be free. Completely, totally, absolutely. That's his will. That's his purpose. That's his plan. That's his desire. That's his hunger. That's what he wants for us. To live out our lives here in this earth as days of heaven upon the earth. And this one scripture right here just really does establish the essence and the presence of God. For wherever the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. There is freedom. There is deliverance. There is everything that God is, as it says, now the Lord is that Spirit. In verse 17, 2 Corinthians, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom. There's release for you and me. Is it God's will for you to be free? That's a test question. Is it God's will for you to be free? It is. It is. It is. I want you to stand up with me and let's just lift our hands to the Lord. Let's just begin to worship Him together. Let's begin to worship Him together. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this night. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing among us. Lord, as a church, you're taking us to new places and to new levels of deliverance so that we can serve one another. And Father, tonight we have heard that it is your plan and your purpose for us to be loose, to be free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If we could, let's just pray in the Holy Spirit together. Oh, sembra casa.